I'm Patrick Pacheco. Next on Theater, All the Moving Parts, we talk with a team of experts about why everything is now coming up Sondheim. Hello, I'm Patrick Pacheco. Welcome to Theater All the Moving Parts and a two-part special on the legacy of the late, great Stephen Sondheim. First, I'm joined by Juan Ramirez, chief critic for Theaterly, blogger Matt Koplick of Broadway Breakdowns, and Ruthie Feerberg, executive editor of Broadway News. Then I speak with Elizabeth Wolven, an author and CUNY professor, and David Benedict, London critic for Variety and authorized biographer of Stephen Sondheim. Welcome, Matt. Welcome, Ruthie. Welcome, Juan, uh, to Theater All the Moving Parts. And I think this has to be one of the most attractive groups that's ever inhabited this studio and brought the age curve down as well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in 1994, New York Magazine headline is Sondheim God. Since his death in November of 2021, there have been four major revivals of his work on Broadway, Company, Into the Woods, Sweeney Todd, and Merrily We Roll Along, which comes to Broadway this fall after a sold-out run at New York Theatre Workshop. In light of these revivals, how would each of you answer the question, is Sondheim God? Let's start with you, Matt. I don't think I needed this year of revivals to think that he was God. I grew up being told that he was the ultimate. And over time, as I got more exposed to his works, I was like, yeah, no, this is this is pretty incredible stuff. I think that uh, the popularity of these revivals just in reinforces that mm -hmm. he's the best. I, I'm always uh, hesitant to say words like God so flippantly because you never know who you're going to trigger. Ruthie, is Sondheim God trigger anything in you? It triggers a lot in me, actually. There are godlike qualities to mm. Sondheim is what I will say. But do I think he is God? No, because Sondheim still comes from other influence, right? Sondheim himself would say that he wouldn't have gotten anywhere without Oscar Hammerstein. Mm -hmm. So, and then I think it continues to iterate. Did Sondheim create um, absolute masterpieces and absolutely flawed <laughs> works like God? Yes. The prolific nature of Sondheim is what I think leads us so often to thinking of him as whether you want to call it God or just the ultimate, the father of musical theater. There are a lot of gifts from, from that man. Um, and he certainly is singular but I think he comes from something and he led to something else. Juan, what's God like to, uh, oh, to Stephen Sondheim? Oh I mean, I, I think of him, I wanna say personally, like I ever knew him, haha. -ha. But in the way that his collaborators have talked about him, I mean, like you think of the way that Elaine Stritch, for example, talks about him and you feel like she's talking about being in contact with God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like this all knowing and he has that sort of meticulous craftsmanship to everything he does that I think Maybe, and he's always there. Someone asked me recently, am I a Sondheim fan? Because I haven't been talking about him recently. And I was like, he's just always there. Yeah. So I, don't, I don't need to be talking about him to be you know, checking in with my inner Sondheim every day. It, yeah. which we should probably say he was the first one to mock that in Sondheim on Sondheim. There was actually a song called God. God. And in it, he mocks uh, his, uh, his elevated status. Still you have to have something to believe in. Something to appropriate, emulate, overrate, might as well be Steven. And this box contains my fingernail clippings. I'm thinking of sending them to the Smithsonian. He would always say that everything he knew about characters of his shows came from the book writers. And I mean, the opening song of Sunday in the Park with George came from a monologue that James Lapine wrote for him. Well, there are worse things than staring at the water on a Sunday. But that, I think, makes him so unique in the sense that he, you know, would create all these amazing things and be so open about where it came from, that it wasn't just from divine intervention. Uh, Hat tip to you, Wheeler, 
uh, oh, his book yeah. writers, mm -hmm. Hugh Wheeler on Sweeney e. Todd and Little Night Music, mm -hmm. hat tip to George Firth and company, mm -hmm. hat tip to Arthur Lawrence. Mm -hmm. uh, they were Wyden. all great. John Weidman and uh, James John Weidman and, and James Lapine. And uh, James Goldman, yeah? James Possibly. Goldman on Follies. Follies. Yeah. Speaking of George Firth and company, obviously there was a radical revival and re reinvention mm -hmm. by Marion Elliott recently on Broadway, a gender swap in which Katrina Lenk mm -hmm. uh, played what had been originally written as a male role. In what way do you think this revival may have reshaped feelings about company? Ruthie? Well, as a woman who is about to turn 35 and is unmarried <laughs> in New York City, um, <laughs> this revival made a red dress. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I was dressed for the part. Um, I am having a company themed birthday party this year. Mm. It has been decided with silver balloons and Maker's Mark and all of that. <laughs> um, a very real small box. <laughs> yeah, something like that. No, but in all sincerity, um, uh, it's not. It's not that company didn't have legs before this, mm -hmm. but I think that that is the question of revivals in general, is like, what is it saying to the audience that is going to be seeing it right now? And an unmarried man, 35 in New York now, as Marianne herself said, is like, who cares, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Maybe, and I honestly can't even fathom that there was a time, but apparently in the 70s, like that it was a moment mm -hmm. that that was like, you know, problematic or something to question, at least. Um, and I think it's much more uh, relatable to at least, you know, the women in the audience, the marryable women in the audience, <laughs> um, those who wish to get married, those who don't know what they want. Um, all of those questions feel extremely present mm. um, for this revival in, in particular. Did you think that, that of all of Sondheim's musicals, one that company was most in need of updating? I don't know. I love that show so much, but I also love, you know, it's a good old-fashioned vaudeville thing. For me, coming at it from the perspective of a gay man, I think turning um, the Amy, Amy character into mm -hmm. Jamie, Jamie for not getting married, you know, even just the way that certain lines that are probably just throwaways in the previous productions, like, just because we should get married doesn't mean we Just could. because we can. We can doesn't mean we should. Yeah. Uh -huh. That, you know, I can never sort of see that song again performed the same way again. <laughs> hey, buddy! Wow! We're, we're really getting married! Yeah. Oh! Part of me is everybody there because if everybody's there, wanna thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate your going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do and not a word of it to Paul. Remember, Paul, you know the man I'm gonna marry, but I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is. But I thank you all for the gifts and the flowers. Thank you all, now it's back to the showers. Don't tell Paul, but I'm not getting married today. Do I think that we need to, like, need to stick with a uh, woman, Bobby, from here on out? No, but I'm glad that we have opened right. that. And maybe we have, you know, we flip other genders in the show and we'd like, you know, reconfigure it in those sorts of ways. Speaking of uh, company and Firth and Sondheim were always adamant about shutting down any idea that Bobby was gay. Do you think it would work with Bobby as a gay protagonist? I don't, now? I don't. Um, they, I know they tried that. Uh, they tried to do an all gay company uh, a while back that Sondheim shut down. He said, this doesn't work, shut it down. Uh, the, 90s revival that Roundabout did, they did some updates and they included a scene. It's the couple on the balcony, uh, Susan and- Peter. Susan Peter. and Peter, yes. Okay. Um, you know, they act to, they're divorced, but now they're actually happier. And Bobby and Peter had a moment together and Peter says, you ever have a homosexual experience, Bobby? I think they even included it in the Raul Esparza revival. And it was just sort of to address mm -hmm. that possibility, uh, which I just think is, I don't know, it just opens up a whole other, you know, Pandora's box of, of things that I don't think company's really about. Because I've always felt that Bobby is like not even really the point of company. Bobby is sort of our window into the conversation about relationships yes. and marriage in general. I think the thing about Bobby being gay is that I think that's such a, it's a solution and you don't want a show to be solved. You know, it's like, oh, Bobby's gay. Where's right. the rest of the show? It, it'll be hard to judge the commercial prospects of company as it goes forward. 
mm. because this was one of the best, uh, most critically acclaimed productions. It won five Tony Awards, including Best Revival, and yet ran less than 300 performances. Mm. In fact, all of the revivals of Company haven't run very long. What do you think of its future commercial prospects? Well, I think that you have to figure out how to market the story of Company because that's, I think that's the hard thing to communicate outside the four walls of that theater. What is this about? It's about a 35 year old man or woman and all of their married friends. Is that like, yes, that is what it's about. You can't convey the development or the arc or the emotion that you're experiencing through that music, through that orchestration. You can't describe the magic and the play logic of that set. You can't, it's very hard to communicate those things. And it's why I pay a lot of attention to the way that shows are being advertised and marketed. Moving on, obviously, to uh, Sweeney Todd and Into the Woods. When I went to both of those productions, they played like rock concerts mm -hmm. in a way that they never did in their original incarnation. As one of you were saying before we started, mm -hmm. there is just this passionate, extremely emotional yeah. response. Mm. What do you count for the passion? I think in the case of Sweeney, they hired very intelligently. I feel like there are people coming at that show from so many different, you know, whether you're like a Jordan Fisher fan from like his Disney stuff, you're like a mom who loves Josh Groban, you're a theater gay who loves Emily Ashford, you know, there's so many like ins to that. It's still one of the most mind blowing sort of audience responses I've ever seen to a show. I'm glad, I don't think it's a perfect revival, but yeah. it's somebody's first experience with Sweeney Todd. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're also both very, uh, that and Into the Woods both were very respectful revivals of the material itself. Not that the company revival wasn't, but they pretty much left the show alone. They didn't do anything bonkers with it, which I think we Yeah, which we've seen for a long time with Into the Woods especially. I mean, I think every theater person's like, I've survived how many weird visions of Into the Woods, but um, <laughs> Sweeney Todd too, you know, with the John Doyle production or all the downsizing productions, it, you know, this, both of them were full blown, you know, full orchestra star casting productions, which I think gave some theater fans excitement of just, I get to hear that score with a 26 piece orchestra again. That's amazing. It feels more like an event that way. Ruthie, both of these musicals had been made into films mm -hmm. and relatively popular films at that. Do you think that had, that fit into the frenzies? I don't know that they did. I think if anything, maybe they popularized the scores made people who wouldn't be aware of the original cast albums aware of the music that existed. Maybe that brought some people in. But I really do agree with Juan that with both of these most recent productions of Sweeney and Into the Woods, it comes down to casting. I think we, people were losing their minds for Josh Groban, Annalie Ashford, Jordan Fisher. I think people were losing their minds because when I saw Into the Woods at the beginning of the Broadway run, Sarah Bareilles on stage. If you saw her in Waitress, the mm. audiences were pretty jazzed as well. You've changed. You're thriving. There's something about the woods. Not just surviving. You're blossoming in the world. But then you're also adding on top of that, you know, Patina Miller, um, Gavin Creel, and Joshua Henry, and Philippa Sue, who brings a Hamilton fan base for me as a theater fan was so exciting because it was marquee names without being marquee names, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If you're a commercial producer, are you basically saying to this commercial producer that if you're going to produce Sondheim on Broadway, you better have a star? Honestly, I would probably say that, but I think that's I what- think a, If you're gonna produce anything- Yeah, you, you, you need to, or you need something to give investors a reason to invest other than the fact that they just like the show. You know, uh, you gotta, you gotta lead with the kind of confidence that they will make their money back. I mean, for every popular title like Sweeney Todd or Into the Woods, you know, you got Pacific Overtures or Merrily. And Merrily is another one where, uh, similar to Into the Woods, Yes, there are names in that, but no one is Hugh Jackman on terms of level of fame. Right. It's a collection. I mean, I guess Daniel Radcliffe, Radcliffe, you know, him and Jonathan yes. Groff and Lindsay Mendez combined, as well as this being the first, you know, production to come to Broadway of Merrily in decades. That, you know, 
you have that star power as well as like Sweeney and Into the Woods. What Into the Woods also has going for it, obviously, is that it is being done by high school and colleges, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, probably more than any other Sondheim musical. Uh, Middle schools aren't doing follies? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I, no, but uh, <laughs> I read recently that a lot of the high school drama clubs only do the first act. Mm -hmm. Yes. Of, That's the junior version. Of Into yeah. the Woods, which ends obviously happily ever after. What are they missing by not doing the second act, especially in an educa education crisis like we're in right now? Yeah. I hated that musical up until this latest production at Encores because the movie I did slept through, honestly. And I saw the musical, I saw the middle school version, which is just the first act. I mean, the second act is sort of where it all hits, right? And I also yeah. think, not to take anything away from child actors, but I don't know if you can imbue that show with any sort of like wit or intelligence at that age. Uh -huh. So it's all very sort of nice. I honestly, maybe one of you can speak to this. I have always been surprised that Stephen Sondheim allowed Into the Woods Jr. Mm -hmm. to yeah. exist. Mm -hmm. I Rent was due. I, I just maybe, like very seriously, I really would love to know what was going on in his life and with the people around him at that moment that it's better to give them a little than nothing maybe was, was the philosophy. But I do think that he would say, and most anyone who's seen the full show would say, that the real lessons come in the second act. You, you get a payoff in the second act. You get a finish, you know, you're only up to this part of the arc at the end of the first act. Um, that I also, no one is alone, that we're a community. Well, all of everything that they're, I also think that we underestimate children every single day of the week. Oh, yeah. I think that maybe you don't want a four or five year old confronting death, but I think that eight, nine and 10 year olds know what death is. Mm -hmm. And so to deny them the opportunity in an educational setting, especially to learn about grief, to learn how to recover from grief, to learn how to band together in grief, um, to learn from fear, all of the things that we learn from Into the Woods, there's a reason that he cast that story on storybook characters. Mm -hmm. They're not just people living in yeah. New York City or something, right? It's because the lessons really are for everyone. And that is a really palatable delivery system for a lot of things that are impalatable. So I, I think we shortchange children when we take that away. What accounts for your own personal passion for Sondheim? His <laughs> lyrics. For me. Yeah. His lyrics. Can you tell us your favorite, uh, among your favorite, what, what lyric just makes you think Sondheim is God? I have it on a, mm -hmm. a calligraphed piece next to my bed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's Sunday in the Park with George because mm -hmm. I'm a writer and I am sometimes feeling like I am always saying the same thing or someone else has said it before me and it's let it come from you, then it will be new. Give us more to see. Anything you do, let it come from you. Then it will be new. Give us more to see. And what accounts for your passion, Matt? I think it's intergenerational because I fell in love with Into the Woods first as a kid, and then my dad introduced me to Follies, and my grandmother introduced me to Company. And it just means different things to different people. And so in addition to just objectively good writing, I have memories of my relationships with everyone in my family with his stuff and how we all come at it, differ come at it differently. My dad and I talk about Benjamin Stone and Follies every other day. <laughs> we talk about Sally Durant Plummer weekly. Um, I think now that uh, we both lived a little bit more life and we both have had our heart broken from life, I think now is the time that we start looking into passion. But as of right now, my dad and I are very much like, we'll talk about Follies till everyone's dead uh, yeah. or everyone's asleep anyway. One. Line, I think it would be the, the Sunday line as well, which might be, I mean, if I could quote that entire show and make that my sort of Sondheim line. I don't think there's ever been a time where I, I don't at least well up listening to that cast recording. Uh, the first Sondheim, like Gypsy, I think weirdly. I saw the Patti LuPone production and I was way too young to understand what was going on, but it, her voice physically hit me. You
and it stayed with me and then I just sort of dug into it. I feel like, to go back to the sort of God metaphor, it's like a sort of, you check in with Sondheim, like he finds you in so many different ways throughout your life and there's so many different characters you relate to. There's so many different ways into his writing um, that I find so beautiful. There's a passion that directors have to quote unquote fix the problematic shows of <laughs> Stephen Sondheim. Chief among them, it seems, Merrily We Roll Along. Yeah. Mm. Do you think they finally fixed, quote unquote, fixed? No, Merrily that is we that is along? that is the annoying person's favorite Sondheim, in my opinion. <laughs> it is such a juvenile show. <laughs> there are pleasures to be had, but we can admit that this god had some Laws. lesser than shows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, does anybody want to? come to the defense? I haven't seen this production yet. Uh, I've never seen Merrily work. Merrily is a show for me, similar to like Mac and Mabel or Candide, where I really love listening to it. And then when I see the show, I'm like, oh, you don't totally work. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think some of Sondheim's best songs are in that show. But again, it's all about context. It's always been weird to me that people have called his shows cold. I'm like, there is so much feeling oh, in, God, in yeah. this stuff. I think there's a clarity in his lyrics that comes from, at one point he was vulnerable, but by the time he got to the page, it's been resolved for him at least. And I think that leads people to say that. But uh, I, I agree, it's yeah. a surface level. But also like the script. It's like, not Lloyd Webber making you cry. Yeah, it's 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 more, because it's it's a gray area, right, of, of life. I mean, Follies was famously hated by so many people when it came out and that, I think, because of the honest, honesty of that show, uh, th the fact that nothing is resolved in it, nothing is uh, really clarified, it's all just intellectual feeling. And I, I, think, but, pe I think people want answers a lot of the times. That's shows. really what it is. It, it, people yeah. want answers and he asks many more questions and offers many more riddles. Yeah. <laughs> Too Many Mornings is a very emotional song. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so much of that score. Did we ever feel so happy then? What lesser of his lesser musicals would you want to revive if you had a magic wand? I think so much Sondheim is revived. That's yeah. what's making mm. it hard for me. A Pacific like, Overture, say. I, so, but the uh, shows for me that aren't revived as much are the ones that like, I, yeah. I, anyway, Pacific Overtures is actually one that I do find kind of clinical and not very emotional personally. Um, I've never been moved by that show. I've always been, uh, I've always admired it on an intellectual level, but I don't feel the need to see it again. Uh, and yet his favorite song comes from that show. I mean, he also thought The Wiz was one of the greatest musicals of all time. So I'm just, his taste is his taste, but his work is his work. The favorite mm. song is Someone in a Tree. Yes, yes, yes. Tree. I will say that there are certain shows that I want to make sure are continually produced mm -hmm. of Sondheim's. Like, I want Sunday in the Park to be continually done. I mm -hmm. want Company to be continually done. I want Assassins to be continually done. Because of the things, because of the aspects of humanity that they force audiences to look at on mm -hmm. a stage. I think oh, yes. I could have gone to see the latest company production 1,000 more times, but yeah. I want to see the next one just as much. Yeah. You know, everyone mm. has such a personal relationship and take on Sondheim that, like, I don't know if I wanted to see who the seventh Bobby was in this production. You know, I want someone else to come along and yeah. give us that version. I want to see Audra's Gypsy. I want to see, um, oh my God, who, uh, LaShawn's is Gypsy. I want to see everybody, like, you know, not putting into yeah. the this role, this mold or whatever, but just I want to, you know, maybe off Broadway. Maybe it's not this, like, Let's have this be the best-selling production of all time, but just keep them coming and keep the ideas coming. I want a really lush night music. We haven't mm. gotten that. And mm. I mean, I still mourn the production we didn't get with Natasha Richardson. And I'm just like, I give it to me. I need, I need some Oscar-winning actress to come to Broadway and just do it. I need- Well, Catherine a, did that. A Catherine Zilla show. Yes, but with a <laughs> kazoo and a xylophone. I want a 25-piece <laughs> orchestra. I want Trevor Nunn away from it. I want someone who's gonna make it fashionable That's and really fun. That's really what I, I want. Original Sondheim orchestrations. Yeah. If we're going to be reviving these shows a and lot. A and a tip to Jonathan Sweeney Sweeney He oh, yeah. about that. There was no whistle. 
There was um, no whistle. We have to wrap up, but I want to, uh, for the last question, I want, obviously, uh, Sondheim died November 26, 2021. When you heard the news, what was the first thought that came into your mind? Well, I almost died because I was driving and like five people called me to make sure I knew. Um, yeah, I was sad. I pulled over, listened to the Angela Lansbury gypsy recording and cried. Mm. And then I went about my day. Ruthie? It's really freaky. I was watching Tick, Tick, Boom. And based mm. on the timing of when I was watching it, the Sondheim voicemail was playing at the moment that the news broke that he died. Um, I know that's not when he died, but that's when the world found out. And I was sitting there listening to his voice saying, you've got a bright future. The main thing though, is that it's first rate work and has a future. And so do you. I'll call you later with some thoughts if that's okay. Meanwhile, be proud. I think for the theater community, the difference is, is how Stephen Sondheim continued to nurture the theater of tomorrow, how he continued to show up to today's theater as some sort of stamp of approval. Not necessarily, I like this production or this production is good, but I want the theater to keep going and I will continue to show up to it until the day I die. And so we lost that person, that person that carries the banner for our art form that day. What's so remarkable about what you just said was that it was Jonathan Larson in a posthumous work of, that, that saw the light of day posthumously at the same time. Mm -hmm. You couldn't Yeah, so there's the, not, you know, his, his influence is not lost by any means. Matt, what, what was your response? I know I had a lot of conflicting feelings. A lot of them felt selfish at the time because I, you know, when someone so, you know, huge passes who had an impact on everyone, you know, we always hear this one hurts and people will tell stories about meaning them or not meaning them or what their work meant to them. And my brain kind of split in two when I would go online and see everyone's reaction of, you know, oh, I'm not that unique in my feeling of this. That makes me feel a little sad, but it also makes me feel good that we all are feeling the same way at the same time, right? Yeah, that was what was so impressive about the fact that there was this impromptu concert mm -hmm. in Times Square in which mm -hmm. every actor just went down to Times Square and sang Sunday in the Park mm -hmm. with George, which you but can't watch on YouTube without absolutely tearing up. I think Arthur Miller uh, was the one who said that when you're in the presence of great art, the only proper response is gratitude. Mm -hmm. So that's what I felt. I just felt so. grateful, and I feel grateful to you, Matt, Ruthie, and Juan for this wonderful and emotional <laughs> discussion. But how could it have been otherwise? Of course. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We're taking a short break. When we return, I talk with Professor Liz Woolman and David Benedict, London critic for Variety and authorized Sondheim biographer. We are back. I'm now with Liz Woolman, professor of music at CUNY's Baruch College, and David Benedict, who joins us on video live from his study in London. Adding to our discussion of the 18 Broadway shows on Sondheim's resume is the 19th. Here we are, which will have its world premiere this fall at NYC's The Shed. Welcome, Liz. Welcome, David. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And since you're in London, perhaps we should start with, is Sondheim's reputation uh, significantly different in the UK than it is in America? Interesting. I, I don't think it is in particular. I think there was a point at which um, there was a lot of rather interesting production of Sondheim's work at a point at which it wasn't being massively revived in the US to the same degree. And there's a certain amount of freedom, I think, given that we, we are a different country interpreting the work. 
there was a certain freedom around style of production uh, that um, was perhaps not evident in the US. But as the years went on, I think uh, that degree of experimentation appeared on both sides of the Atlantic. But certainly in the in the 80s and early 90s, I think a lot of very exciting productions were happening here. And there seemed to be more revivals of his work at significant addresses here than there were at significant addresses in the States. But as I say, um, in the course of his long life, I think that all changed. And there have been obviously major, major productions uh, in the US uh, of his work in the last 10 or 15 years. Liz, I wanted to ask you, in the US, do you still think that Sondheim is a rarefied, acquired taste? No. The reason that I say that it's not so rarefied anymore is that he is not at, by the time he died, he was no longer just a musical theater composer. He's also, I mean, his song catalog has been interpreted by so many different people. And I just checked her name earlier, but the, the, very recently, there have been um, interpretations along singer-songwriter models by Ellery Ward. Ward. Yes, Ellery, Ellery Ward. Ward. Uh, Judy Collins, of course, had a, a Absolutely. Number one hit, and then how many different jazz stylings or interpretations of so many and, and vocal versions of Send in the Clowns? Isn't it rich? Are we a pair? David, as his biographer, um, had he ever registered to you how he wanted to be remembered? What he wanted his legacy to be? He said that after he's gone, um, he doesn't mind. Uh, he doesn't really. He didn't really care. Um, he cared about about the work uh, in his lifetime. Um, um, he wasn't writing for posterity. Posterity would would look after itself. Um, he was. Uh, he was interested in in all types of theatre, uh, and would come to London regularly and devour theatre at every possible uh, moment. And that's what he was interested in. He was interested in theatre as, as as a living form. He was interested in 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 making sure that his productions or productions of his work were um, as theatrically vivid as possible, which meant that he was not interested in productions mimicking the circumstances of the original productions. Mm -hmm. He was extremely excited by the input of people like John Doyle, who um, was initially successful in, in this country, and then with the success of Sweeney Todd, done with acting musicians on Broadway. Mm -hmm. um, um, based himself in in the U.S. and did a, and did a lot of extremely radical productions, and then in this country, Marianne Elliott, whose production of Company uh, then went to Broadway, uh, and Dominic Cook's uh, production mm -hmm. of Follies, which arguably solved all the problems uh, that had beset <laughs> Follies since its original production. Yeah. And he's also going to direct the film. He's in pre-production with the film of Follies as well. And I wanted to ask you and I'm going to put you on the spot, in a word, how would you describe the Sondheim legacy? Enduring. <laughs> and perhaps, I think in the article, you also described it as revolutionary. Yes, I think um, I'm going to launch into a catalogue of generalizations here, so <laughs> beware. But on the whole, um, Sondheim was a radical in a largely reactionary form. Um, uh, yeah. There's a line in The Sound of Music, which of course was um, the last musical written by his mentor, Oscar Hammerstein, in the song, The Sound of Music, I know I will hear what I've heard before. And to a large extent, certainly prior to uh, his arrival on the scene, musicals were written around what people wanted to hear. Traditionally, musicals were um, mindless entertainment with leggy showgirls. Oscar Hammerstein served notice on that with Showboat and absolutely changed the entire face of Broadway in 1943 with Oklahoma. 
But Sondheim comes along and, uh, and goes an awful lot further. And I think the great thing about his legacy is that he taught um, musical theatre writers, both, both book writers and lyricists and composers, that if you do it right, you can make a musical out of pretty much anything. <laughs> as, as he did. Liz, uh, do your students consider him revolutionary? No. Uh, um, sorry, yes, I'm ahead. very quick with with quick answers. Yeah, um, I I am not as a historian and a scholar. I'm not a big believer in the notion of things that are truly revolutionary. You build on what you've got. So, with respect, and I do think that he really pushed the ticket in a number of different ways in terms of. Um, some of the compositions that he created, certainly the the interiority of the characters is is you see more of that with Sondheim, although he certainly learned that at the at the feet of Oscar Hammerstein. Um, but to imply that he was revolutionary is to imply that that this is taking place in a vacuum and that there are all these other. I mean, I think that Sondheim came along at a time when the work he was doing, really fit the angstiness of a changing Broadway and of a changing musical theater world. But getting uh, to the point in terms of how your students regard him, how do they regard him if they don't regard him revolutionary? I mean, I'm sure that some of my students think that he is the be all and end all. My graduate students, everyone knows Sondheim. I would argue that the, the field of musical theater studies, which I work within, um, he's really central, I think, to a lot of theories about um, the history and development of musical theater. This is not in any way to, to diminish his impact. I just don't really believe, like something revolutionary to me is something that like, absolutely unseen. We've never seen anything like this before. We won't again. And I think that maybe that's pushing a little bit because he was responding in a very interesting way. He came along in the 60s, ultimately, is when, and then found his stride in the 70s at a time when Broadway was changing very significantly, the country was changing, the culture. And I think that he was able to tap into the angstiness of it I want to uh, get into Here We Are, but David, before I get into Here We Are, which of course is the 19th and uh, posthumous uh, show of Sondheim's, do you want to rebut anything that Elizabeth just said? I think we are, we are far less far apart than uh, the discussion might thus far have suggested. When I say he was revolutionary, I'm, I was meaning specifically within the form. He is not a radical revolutionary within within culture. I absolutely agree with Liz about that. But I do think that a lot of the analysis she's just given about, about how Broadway was changing, I think the Broadway musical changed, absolutely. But I think he was a driver of that change rather than a reflection thereof. I think we should get to Here We Are. And I should say that it's based on two Louise Binwell movies, The Exterminating Angel and The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie. It's being uh, co-written by David Ives and directed by Joe Mantello. And I suppose I should describe it the way Sondheim himself described it in a talk show. And that is the first act is a group of people trying to find a place to have dinner and they run into all kinds of strange and surreal things. And in the second act, they find a place to have dinner, but they can't get out. Um, <laughs> can you add anything to that? Uh, I, can add, I can add remarkably little uh, <laughs> because, um, I mean, that is, that is all that was, that was uh, publicly available. All I know is, is that uh, uh, at the point, the last time I spoke to him prior to his death, uh, he had got most of the first act done. Uh, the second act he was still struggling with. Quite what we will see uh, when the show is up and running, I really don't know. Um, because it's not as if, well, it was all there and it hadn't been orchestrated. No, it, it absolutely was not all there. Um, so we may be seeing something fairly rough and ready, or we may, for all I know, be seeing mainly act one um, that was more than ready. So it's, it, it's, it's highly conjectural. I was extremely surprised to learn that, that it was, 
going to be staged at all, I have to say. I heard that it was about 60% finished. Uh, at least the score was about 60% finished. Liz, why do you think Sondheim was attracted to this subject matter? I keep mentioning the, the word angst, but I don't think that that's an accident. I think that he really taps in. I think there must be something appealing to him about, or there was something appealing to him about, like, the hilarity and also the anxiety and the sort of tragedy of a like group of middle class people that want to all go out and have dinner and how very difficult <laughs> like how disruptive or anxiety provoking that could possibly be only Sondheim would come up with something like that. That really does sound like right in the pocket. One of the things as a composer that he really does beautifully is capture the the jangliness like the 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 conflicting sort of shifting moods of daily existence. David, did, did Sondheim ever express to you, uh, A, why he was attracted to these two films? I know he was a huge film buff. He, he was encyclopedic about film um, and will, you know, it's not like somebody went, oh, have you ever seen these films? He was bound to have seen them. Um, and you could literally talk about almost any film and he would tell you who the cinematographer was, uh, let alone who, who directed it and who its stars were. He'd, he'd even discussed it way back when with Hal Prince. He, he knew of the films, there were ideas around it that had been floating in his head for a very, very long time. Similarly, a, a, a production like Roadshow, which I think eventually mm -hmm. appeared in, I think, 2008, Mm -hmm. um, he, he read an article in the New Yorker in, in the late 1950s about those brothers. Um, that had been brewing for some time. I mean, I think it's true of most works of artists that, that, that they don't just you know, occur one day and then you have a discussion and then, and then you write them. They're, there are long held ideas that, that maybe float around in your head until you find the right form uh, and, then, and then they come into land. You mentioned Roadshow, which was his last show. In 2008, it was it finally reached the public after many permutations. It took him 25 years, perhaps, to write another show. Why did it take him so long? He was aware that um, his, his work was no longer uh, as current Broadway had completely changed. Um, uh, he'd moved away from Broadway with with his collaboration with with Lapine uh, to playwrights Horizons and and to to a whole kind of different approach. I mean, I think if he'd had ideas and and they'd borne fruit, he would have written more. Um, he, he was a notoriously slow writer, mm -hmm. and uh, he needed he needed the impetus. He didn't find them. There, there were ideas that he had. There was a there was a point at which he was going. He was thinking of doing a version of Groundhog Day, which of course Tim Minchin went on to do. But he couldn't find he couldn't find the right way of doing it, and and passed on it. There were also a lot of revivals um, that that he worked on and variants on uh, on production. So it's not as if he sat around twiddling his thumbs. Was his was his reputation intimidating to him? To a, oh, a blank I, yes. canvas. Yeah, I think I think that um, I very much doubt that there's an uh, an interesting artist that doesn't find uh, a huge level of success to be both pleasing and troubling because expectations uh, are are killers. You get less confident as you get older. I'm sure you've heard this before. It's just the more you know, the more you're frightened, and and also. When you build up a reputation, then people are expecting things from you. And yes. That expect well, you know that yourself. The expectations make you very hesitant mm -hmm. about doing anything mm -hmm. else. Liz, what what do you consider Sondheim's masterpiece, and why? Right at this minute, the one that comes to mind, just only because I've seen it recently, and it's a, an entire family hit, not just me. Sweeney Todd. Sweeney. David. I'm going to be extremely boring and completely agree with Liz. I think the masterpiece is, is Sweeney Todd. And actually, Act One of Sweeney Todd is a staggering achievement. The last 25 minutes of, of, uh, of Sweeney Todd, Pretty Women, through the Epiphany, through Little Priest, preceded by the, by the, the quartet, which a, a very notable British critic said was uh, the finest quartet since Rigoletto, and I wouldn't disagree. My mind, my little lamb, my pet 
It's a word I hate, but the storytelling in that show through that last 25 minutes of Act One is utterly audacious and really extraordinary. And the range of emotions that it takes an audience through is remarkable. You mentioned earlier that Marianne Elliott had convinced Sondheim, and he was skeptical at first, to do a fairly radical reinvention of company. Do you have any information in terms of the rights holders to Sondheim's oeuvre? You'll excuse the that, that pretentious word, but um, that they might be more liberal in terms of allowing more radical reinventions of the uh, revivals of Sondheim along the way now. I think they've always... I don't think that uh, Sondheim productions he always got very angry if you called them sondheim productions because he was more than aware that um without james lapine and mm -hmm. james goldman and everybody else there would be no show um uh, but i don't think that you'll find that many directors who uh, uh, will go oh well i really wanted to do this show but they wouldn't let me um the um I would think that the estate will operate in much the same way as, as, as Sondheim did, which is that if you can come up with a cogent dramatic reason why you should set a production of company on the moon, then they'll <laughs> let you uh, uh, set a production of company on the moon. Who holds the rights to Sondheim's? Um... Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but it would, it would, everything would go through uh, his office, which is run by the entertainment lawyer, Rick Pappas, who is one of those people that should be in charge of every estate because he gets it, uh, rather than the, famously the Samuel Beckett estate who um, um, have closed productions down because stage directions were not observed. Ah, David, as his authorised biographer, what is it that people don't know about Sondheim? Well, you'll have to read the book, but <laughs> <laughs> obviously I'm not going to tell you my trade secrets. I hate people that go onto programmes and don't answer the questions they've been asked. <laughs> then however, I allow you, I allow you to however, indulge um, me. I think, I think the important thing to recognise with Sondheim, and uh, I don't know if you'll both agree with this, but I think when I... When I first started work on it and, and, and was talking to my agent, I remember saying the thing about Sondheim to recognise is that he is a major American writer with a voice. And I don't think it's very interesting, or it's not interesting to me, to compare Stephen Sondheim with, I don't know, Jerry Herman or other contemporaries or, or the people that have followed him, like, like Jason Robert Brown. I think he's an American dramatist like... Alby and mm. Mannett, who happens to use music. Now, I know that he didn't write the books, and as we've said, he was he was much indebted and made sure that everybody understood that. But I think, as Liz says, you know, there is there is a voice in in the work, whether it's you know a funny thing happened on the way to the forum or or passion, um, there is a voice in there, and I think he's a major figure in American drama. It so happens that his work with one exception, uh, uh, is all musical. Liz, we don't have much time left, but what is most important to you to convey to your students about Stephen Sondheim? That's a great question. Um, I think that he came along at a time when Broadway was experiencing, I mean, certainly through the 70s, Broadway was experiencing something of a crisis. The city was near bankruptcy. Broadway was something of a cottage industry at the time that was not drawing the same kind of, um, and that, again, that he tapped into a zeitgeist, I think, at a time. I want students to understand that. And I also think that I want them to recognize that he was 
I mean, he was an artist that was able to ride through that period and um, kind of keep his head above some of the really extreme commercial changes that were happening. I mean, Broadway did become a much more global force over time. And I think mm -hmm. that also one of the things that's important about Sondheim is even if you don't really, ah, I don't feel much about, I know nothing about Sondheim, I don't have any relationship with Sondheim. It's not hard to build a relationship with at least one of his songs. I mean, he does. He's He, he has left behind this enormous legacy. Um, and I think that it is still, I mean, we have lost him, but his what he has left behind is still very much alive and I think rather viable. David? Um, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, in your own mind, your book will be successful on Sondheim if it does what? If it explains to people what Liz has just said, I think. <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, um, I think that he is a major force within American culture. Um, I think that, you know, something like... For a long time, his biggest earner was a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Um, this was massively superseded by uh, Into the Woods, you know, which made which made a ton of money on screen. But but there was um in about 2015, I think there was a reunion of um, the original production team at BAM. And um, it sold out so fast they had to do two mm -hmm. performances of it. I went to the first one. And I mean, it was like I thought I thought there'd be a bunch of gay men, um, all all <laughs> like myself, um, myself. Uh, who were all going to you know be fans of of, of Steve. Not a bit of it. Um, there was there was uh, every single demographic was there. They walked onto the stage, and it was like the home football team had won, and they'd come home. I mean, people went bananas. Uh -huh. and it is, it's partly because it's uh, Into the Woods is beloved because it's done a, a cut version is done in schools. Yeah, but it. I just think he's in the water supply. He's nothing like as successful as someone like John Kander. You know, Chicago has been running on Broadway since 1997, and that's a revival. Of, and he he made he's made eye-watering amounts of money. He's commercially more successful than Sondheim, which for a long time oh, yeah. rankled with Sondheim. Uh, yes, I, but he's but he's central in the culture. Uh, in, we, a way, in a way that Kanda, Kanda isn't, or in, in the kind of in, intellectual culture. We've run out of time. I'd like, um, David, to you end, to end our session with Sondheim's words. And that is the last line of Sunday in the Park with George. White, a blank page or canvas, his favorite, so many possibilities. When you asked Liz um, about his legacy, I was going to say it's the fact that there are so many possibilities, and I think that that is, um, and I think that's a, that is a marvelous thing to say because because it it opens things up. In lesser artists describe something and try to nail it down. I think that that he was alive to and excited by. So many possibilities. So many possibilities. One of my favorite uh, tweets uh, when he died was, and I believe that it was either Ariel Tepper or Jennifer Tepper, but it was, we once lived in the same New York City as Stephen Sondheim and Harold Prince, and God was it glorious. Uh, and <laughs> I think that you uh, explained in this uh, interview both, to both of you, and I'm grateful, just why it was glorious. So thank you, Liz. Thank you, David. Thank you. Break a leg on the book. <laughs> it must be so many possibilities. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. I wanted to give you a few moments to respond to a couple of quotes of yours. <coughs> okay. um, you can sweat a lot over music, but it's very fulfilling. Um, I was trained and started out as a composer, and I fell into lyric writing, so to speak. I wanted to do both, but music was my joy. And then, oh gosh, the privilege of being able to write music is just, that's a gift from God. Still feel it. No, I can't, I can't go beyond that. That's can't just it. Beyond. I mean, every musician knows what I'm talking about.
anybody, or even non-musicians. I mean, this music is a magical art. I don't know how the human mind ever got to it, because everything else is somehow representational and literal, including painting. But um, not music. How did that happen? Is it from the birds? Is it from what is that from? How do we learn? How do we make music? How, how did I can understand vaguely how man learned to speak and because he had to communicate things. But what is this? How did man learn to whistle? I mean, you know, how do we, what, and where's the 12 tone scale come from? And I, blah, blah, blah. And I'm ill educated this way, so you could probably answer, but it seems to me miraculous. Thank you for joining us. We look forward to bringing you more fascinating conversations with artists and professionals as New York Theatre, The Fabulous Invalid, regains its invaluable place in American culture. I'm Patrick Pacheco.